In this interview, I talked to Cody Berman of the Phi Show podcast, and he's a 24-year-old entrepreneur. He started a few companies at this point. He spent a little time in a corporate career, if you could call it that. It was, it was very short, and we get into a lot of the details. He actually started a Muse-style business out of the four-hour work week, and it's, in, it's about disc golf. He actually made discs, and we talk about that a little bit. He's a pretty serious podcaster at this point in time, and he dabbles in a lot of different side hustles. We talk about the rule of 72 and some other very important concepts along the lines of like saving and and compound interest, and Cody breaks it down in a very simple way. We get into the weeds a little bit with Cody's side hustles, including freelancing and Etsy printables. Etsy printables are something that I am completely unfamiliar with. He tells us why it is a cool thing to get involved with. It seems to be evolving and he didn't really have any experience with Etsy printables beforehand, but it looks to be a pretty nice way to set up a passive income stream, you know, once you get things set up. Like I said, Cody's a pretty busy dude and he's a co-creator of the Financial Freedom conference and it's in St. Louis. There's some other big hitters involved with this conference including Grant Sabatier and Philip Taylor. So if you haven't heard of those dudes you should google them and then you'll see that this conference is a pretty big deal. There's going to be over 50 speakers and something like a a thousand plus attendee. My name is Doug Cunnington by the way and I normally talk about Amazon affiliate marketing, side hustles, SEO, project management, and a few other things. And now I'm starting to talk a lot more about financial freedom, financial independence, and personal finance in general. So if you dig this episode, you should definitely check out my interviews with Carl Jensen, Mindy Jensen, and actually one of Cody's business partners, Julie Berninger. So I interviewed Julie a few weeks ago and got connected with Cody through her. So I just started pulling on a thread and found a couple people and I sent Cody an email. He was nice enough to chat with me. So if you dig this interview, check out those others, check out some of the success stories on this channel. And without further ado, let's hear from Cody. Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Cunnington here and I'm here with my new friend, Cody Berman. How are you today? What's up, man? Glad to be here. And for the people that don't know you at all, could you give us a quick intro who you are and what do you do? All right, I'll try to keep it short and sweet for you, Doug. So I'm t- uh, Cody Berman, I'm currently 24 years old. I was in corporate banking for a very short stint of my, what you can call career. Actually only seven months, I quit that corporate banking job when I was 22 years old, and I've been doing side hustling and entrepreneurship ever since. Wow. I guess that's, hopefully that's enough for you. I, we can dig into more of my stories as we go through the podcast. <laughs> so what, what did your family and friends think about the seven months in a corporate gig, which is like oh, almost nothing. It's like a blink of an eye. So how did they react when you were like, hey, I kind of want to explore other options? So kind of a mixed bag. I got to give a huge shout out to my mom because she was super, super supportive. She's been in this kind of side hustle entrepreneurship space. And so she's like, go for it, Cody. Like you're going to kill it. Always just hit me with a lot of positive momentum. And I'm like, okay, perfect. Some other people were like, you're an absolute idiot. You're giving up this huge, it's, it's a big paycheck job. Like corporate banking pays very well. They're like, you're so dumb. You could be making 250,000 in five years from now, whatever numbers they're throwing out. And I don't know, man. I just, I went for it. I had a decent amount of support. So it wasn't just everybody telling me I was an idiot. It was some people telling me that you can do this. This is possible. And I jumped in head first. Awesome. And did you have like an entrepreneurial streak in the past, like as a young kid? Yeah. So I was definitely a bit entrepreneurial. I never really got into like some crazy shark tank adventure when I was like 12 years old or anything, but I did my first foray into entrepreneurship was when I was 19. I co-founded a disc golf company we actually manufactured the disc that people throw. And that was after I read the four hour work week and he talked about side hustling and not having to have your money connected with your time on a linear basis. And I was like, oh my God, like I have to go do this thing. And so yeah, my first foray was 19 and I've been on a side hustle grind ever since. Okay, interesting. Cause I used to play disc golf all the time. I think I have like 20 discs. So I was, I was like, oh cool, we have that in common. <laughs> have you ever been to Bozeman, Montana by chance? I have not, no. I used to live like a quarter mile from a pretty nice disc golf course so I could go out, walk the dog basically every day, take a disc and just toss it around just for fun. So 
that's pretty cool. Like what challenges did you experience like trying to, to launch a, I don't even know how you source it or get it, come up with the designs and then marketing and all that stuff. So take your time. Like, what was that like? Yeah. Great questions and questions. I really wish that I knew the answers to back when I started. So we just started bootstrapping this thing. You can imagine two 19 year old kids both came from middle class homes. We didn't have a lot of money. We were really, really bootstrapping this thing. So we went out and tried to just DIY everything. So we, we literally emailed in total over 200 different companies for all the different processes that go into making a disc. So we hit up like 70 different prototyping companies because they're different from the companies that make the molds who are different from the companies that actually produce the disc for you. So think 65 to 70 for each of those types of companies. We had this big spreadsheet hitting them all up. And I mean, either A, they'd be so expensive that they were just completely unattainable for us, or B, they wouldn't give us the time of the day because we're these two 19-year-old kids trying to found this company. Definitely even some hurdles. So after we get all those kind of set up, like I'm sure you you felt discs and like if, if there was like a little uh, dent or a blemish or anything, like you'd notice right away and those wouldn't sell. The process to actually create a disc is so much more complicated than you could ever possibly imagine. And we did not know that from the start. So Trying to figure out that process was a several month, even more than a year learning curve. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it is, uh, it's called Arsenal Discs. Is it still around? Are you guys like still dabbling with it? We are still dabbling. We definitely slowed down a bit last year because I'm sure we'll get into here. I've been doing a lot of other different fun ventures and my, my buddy Jim, who I co-founded the company with, he's doing his own stuff. So we kind of just put it on the back burner last year. We didn't do as much as we would like to do, but a lot of the other things I was doing at a much higher ROI. So it's still in existence. People still buy discs from us. It's just not like my main revenue driver. Okay. And it was spawned from the four hour work week, which my audience is very familiar with. I didn't read it for a while. I think it was maybe like seven years after it came out, but did you try to follow the model like pretty closely? Yeah. So the, the big thing for me again was like, I didn't want to be someone who had to work 40 hours a week to get X paycheck. I wanted to be someone who could spend maybe more than 40 hours for like five years a week and then build this business or build this recurring revenue stream that I can reap the profits from in perpetuity. So like I was really fascinated by, I guess, delineating my time and money, like how, how those things kind of coincide with each other. I was like, I don't want to be someone where it's just a linear thing. I want to be someone where it's more of like an exponential, like a hockey stick. <laughs> Yeah. All right. And so one interesting thing, right? So we're, we're shifting gears a little bit. And I, I realized this because I'm into affiliate marketing and side hustles. And that's what a lot of the audience um, is all about. However, I've, I realized there's a nice intersection, this Venn diagram where people that are interested in side hustles, they potentially hate their job. They're interested in financial independence, even though they may not call it that. And really, like we all just want freedom with our time, which goes directly back to the four hour work week and some of the people that, you know, we follow and your show, right? So you're, you're a podcaster and how'd you get into personal finance and FI? Yeah. So that happened after kind of the Tim Ferriss four hour work week thing. I was really interested in the side hustle stuff. And naturally I started searching like, cause I wanted to make a bunch of money. Honestly, that's where from the very beginning I was like, you know what? I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be driving a Lambo. And you just kind of go down the, you go down the rabbit hole. You start to meet these influencers, these people who are doing these amazing things. I think I did stumble onto Mr. Money Mustache a year later when I was 20, who's for people who don't know, like one of the biggest figureheads in this financial independent space, saw the things he was uh, typing about. And like he had retired at 30 being an engineer. And I looked at the math and I'm a math guy. I went to school for finance and economics. I'm like, this checks out. Like, this is legit. And so all of a sudden, my brain just got rewired. My goals got completely rewired. Instead of that Lambo, I just wanted unlimited time. I wanted freedom to hang up my friends, freedom to spend time with family, freedom to travel and take a month off if I wanted to. And that's ultimately, I love that you said that because I think that is literally the bottom line that connects everyone in this whole financial independence, side hustle, entrepreneurship space is that time freedom. Indeed. Thank you. Because I, Again, I, I'm like seeing the connection because I'm I have my foot in both areas, and I'm I think I was just a little bit interested in Phi, and I think I found uh, Pete's blog a few years ago when I was trying to figure out what to do with some excess money. Good problem to have, and then yeah, it's just the the common thread: freedom with time, and yeah, it, it's very interesting. So you mentioned travel, and just I, we do tangents here, 
So do you have any like amazing travel stories? Cause obviously it, it sounds like you have some free time at this point, leaving the corporate job behind. Yeah, man, definitely more to come. Again, I mentioned I'm 24, so I, hopefully I have a lot of life ahead of me where I can do some traveling. But I mean, I lived in Australia for five months and I was like working on all my side hustles during then. So, I mean, that's just, that was awesome in and of itself that I could just go and like work on my computer as long as I had Wi-Fi. At, let's see, we're recording this in March. So four months ago, the entire month of December I spent in South America and I could still do all my stuff there if I needed to log on. Well, luckily I'd built some systems so I didn't have to be too present, but yeah, man, like just, just kind of building a life where you can go like take off a Friday. Obviously, these are way bigger examples, like taking uh -huh. a month off to go to South America. But if you have the liberty to take off a Monday without asking your boss for permission because, you know, you have a sick family member that you need to bring to the hospital, like that is the ultimate. That is why I'm doing this. Like that's why I'm pursuing financial independence. It's not because I want to quit my job or because I hate work or anything like that. It's just like being able to control your time and not have someone breathing down your neck saying, no, Cody, you can't do that today. Right. And we're going to get into uh, some of the details of the side hustles and that sort of thing. But at this point in time, are you, as I'm interviewing more people, a uh, little, little backstory, as I'm interviewing more people in the FI community, we use retire because that's what the press calls it. But a lot of times folks are working, but they're working on the stuff that they want to work on. So I assume that that includes you because you are indeed doing many things. Are you financial independent? I like this question. It's an interesting question. So there are many definitions to financial independence, as well as retirement, as well as financial freedom. So what I'm, what I am, I like to call cash flow financial independent. So I don't have the. I'm sure your followers have seen like the four percent rule. You say if you want to live on forty thousand dollars a year, you save up a million dollars, and in theory, you can withdraw that four percent, that forty thousand dollars, and it will last you for the rest of your life. That's like traditional financial independence. What cash flow fi is, and a lot of people in real estate can relate to this, I could probably work five hours a week and sustain my lifestyle with still having a savings cushion. So like I'm essentially at the point where, and again, I'm single, I'm a guy, I don't have kids. So people who are going to bash me like, what? That's crazy. My lifestyle is pretty cheap. I'm, I'm definitely a frugal guy. But yeah, having that liberty and having like the five hours a week or less of time that I actually have to work, quote unquote, or quote unquote, have to work. That's what I call cash flow fi or cash flow financial independence. Okay. And just to restate it a different way, like you can cover your expenses based on the money that you're earning from side hustles, real estate, any other income sources, right? Yes. But the, the caveat is that those income sources are like, I could do them for five hours. Like if I was doing that and making, uh, spending 80 hours a week, I wouldn't call myself financially independent by any means. Perfect. <laughs> and I, I think it's key to, to point out again, like with the, uh, the press and a lot of the media, it is a much sexier headline to say like 24 year old Cody retired and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. but it's a little more nuanced than that. And I think it's important to point out because go getters, right? You want to stay busy. You want to work on projects. You want to learn new things, be challenged each day. So it, it totally makes sense. It's not that we were lazy. It's just, that we want to work on the stuff that we want to work on. So cool. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's shift into some of those side hustles. Like what, what are some of your revenue streams out there? Yeah. So I'll try to go in sequential order. So the first one was the disc golf company. And then like you, I kind of started my first foray into being an online influencer in any way, shape or form was my blog. That was April, 2018. Shortly after came my podcast, the Fi show. Then I started getting into some freelancing because at that point I was transitioning out of my corporate banking job and I wanted to have like just know that I could make money online doing freelancing in case shit hit the fan and I needed to make money. So I was like, okay, I can do this. I made some money doing freelance writing and audio editing and some video editing stuff. Then this is a huge turning point actually after this. So it was January 31st of 2019 when I quit that corporate banking job and um, two months later, I actually went on a book tour with Grant Sabatier, who was the author of Financial Freedom, for three months around the country. And so that was just an absolutely revolutionary moment in my career as an entrepreneur, in my career as a person. I met so many amazing people. Grant has showed me so many amazing opportunities. Super awesome guy. And then after that, I started those side hustle courses we've been talking about with my good friend and She's also a, a podcaster in the financial independence space, Julie from Fire Drill Podcast. And I think that's it. <laughs> okay. How did you land that book tour gig? What did you do? Yeah. So one of my, what I like to call superpowers is networking. 
And so, like, I am not someone who takes no for an answer. I, like, if I get shut off at the first door, I'll go around to the side door. If I don't get in the side door, I'll go around the back door. And I just like make, making things happen. So this guy, Grant, I knew him from online, um, from Millennial Money. That was his website. And he was a guy he retired, again, retired at 30 with $1.25 million in the bank. And he was, like, this, this big online presence in the make money, save money space. And I'm like, all right. I saw him at FinCon. This is a personal finance creators event for people who don't know what that is. And I, w I went up and talked to him. We had an awesome conversation. Honestly, talked for like an hour and a half. It was one of the last nights. Sent him a follow-up email the next day. Crickets. He didn't answer. Nothing. I waited like maybe five or six days later. Hit him up again. And the content of these emails was like, hey, man, Cody here. We had an awesome conversation. Like, I'd love to just work with you in any capacity. Like, I'll do anything for free. I just want to learn how you operate. I want to learn how to be a successful entrepreneur. Like, just let me know. I'll do anything to make tech, make your life easier. And until uh, finally, I hit him with a third email, and he finally answers. And he's like, oh, hey, man, like, I just got a lot of emails. So this got lost in the inbox. He's like, I'd love to get some help on my book tour. And I was like, oh, sure. Like, I had no idea what that meant. But I was like, yeah, like, I'll, I'll help you out with your book tour. Let me know. Like, I don't have any experience with publishing or anything, but I can I can email people. I can make some media for you, like whatever you need me to do. And so I was working with him probably for a month, just like mostly outreach and planning events and stuff. And then he's like, hey, like, do you want to come on the book tour with me? And I was like, yep. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so this is while while I'm planning this, I'm still in more corporate jobs. So I'm like sending emails, honestly, like while I work for on, on Grant's behalf. And yeah, then March 1st of 2019, we kicked off the book tour. For three months, 14,000 miles, over 80 events, and it was crazy, man. <laughs> Holy cow. And you were like his right-hand person and took care of whatever he needed on tour? Yep, took care of like scheduling, logistics, email, planning, that type of stuff. Okay, interesting. And I know from the research that I did to um, like prepare for this interview, like you've made the rounds, and I have a hunch that you made a lot of contacts <laughs> – on that book tour, you met a lot of people. You went to FinCon at least once. So I guess some of those in-persons and warm introductions must have played a role. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, for me anyway, and I'm sure a lot of other people operate like this, even if they don't explicitly say this, like meeting someone and shaking their hand and knowing like this is a cool guy or this is a cool girl that I'd want to just hang out with is like the first step in having a successful business relationship. Like if you're someone who's super uptight, even if you have the best company ever, you have the best product ever, like you're not someone I want to work with. And I think a lot of people really do operate like that. Like if you're someone that someone wants to sit down and have a beer with on a Friday night, like you're probably someone that that person will want to work in a business sense too. And I think a lot of people operate when they're networking like a robot. They're like, hello, I'm Cody Berman. This is my companies. And like, if you don't talk to people like they're a real person, then you're not going to get very far at all. So like that's one of the things I do is like try to come to someone even if they're like a quote unquote celebrity at like an, at an event like a FinCon or whatever your niche might be in or you meet like say Pat Flynn for example, just just treat him like a normal guy and you know give him a handshake and maybe he'll be interested in learning about you. Maybe not. You get a lot of no's in networking which kind of sucks sometimes, but being able to handle those no's and you know jump up and get ready for the next opportunity is super super important. So I cannot stress networking enough for people who just and there are a lot of people who are introverted and there are ways to do it if you are introverted. I mean you could even do it with like a nice warm email, like not just like some, you know, some boilerplate plug and play the company name and the person. But yeah, there's just a lot of ways to do networking right and I don't see people taking advantage of those opportunities enough. Cool. And would you call yourself extroverted or introverted? I'm definitely extroverted, which, I, okay. which is which is an added benefit. But I know people who are introverted who are also very successful networkers. And well, I, I was going to say I'm pretty introverted. I, I won't claim that I'm a successful networker, but you and I are talking now. So I, <laughs> exactly. I sort of wiggled my way around. But I actually live pretty close. I live in Longmont. I don't know if I told you that, but I live oh, close yeah. by to like uh, Carl and Mindy Jensen and, and Pete. Mr. Money Mustache, I work at the co-working space and it would have been very easy to come <laughs> come as a like fanboy or something like that. But luckily I was just I wasn't even super familiar with a lot of the people that work out here at Triple M HQ, but there's a lot of cool people and I've interviewed a few of them and I think you definitely can do it as an introvert, but yeah, treat people normally and don't make them feel weird. That's the big thing. Don't make people feel weird. Have you had any experiences where 
because you're a bit of a celebrity now you've made the rounds on a lot of these big <laughs> shows appreciate it <laughs> yeah yeah do you have do you have any fun stories where if not if you don't want to embarrass anyone we could skip it but any fun well, story someone, where someone was not very fun to talk to yeah where maybe somebody <laughs> came up and like tried to you know nail you down and talk to you for like 45 minutes after you did a talk or something oh countless times i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say any names here because i'm not gonna embarrass anyone like you said but like yeah. i've had people come up to me and within two sentences that i'm talking to me they're asking me to be an affiliate for their course it's like that's not how you network like why would i ever want to work with someone like that who's just like so in your face trying to promote their own stuff like that's another thing i didn't really mention is like i'm always a giver first and then if something something gets reciprocated later on that's where you get the gravy like you don't go into a networking relationship begging or like just attacking the person trying to get your own products promoted or whatever the thing might be that you want from this person ultimately like that's not how you that's not how you're supposed to approach it so like with grant like i mentioned before i was like hey man i will work for you for free it wasn't like hey grant tell me all your secrets and like you know like it's not like well, how can i benefit myself it's how can i make your life easier that's how you should that's uh, that's how i tell everyone they should approach networking very good and i want to talk just a little about the fi community too so i, I haven't been to fincon i think i may check it out this year but i've found like the fi community to be like very welcoming like really warm there's such a diverse set of people and can you like just talk about your experience a little bit? Oh yeah, man, and that is a hundred percent accurate. You should definitely go to FinCon because there are a lot of Fi community folks there. Hopefully, I'll see you in twenty twenty in uh, was Long Beach, California. Yeah, but yeah. So the first kind of transformative event for me was actually this thing called Camp Fi or Camp Financial Independence, and that was in January of twenty eighteen down in Florida. And the reason why I wanted to go there one was because I like the Fi community, but two. I live in Massachusetts and it's not warm in January. So those are kind of the two things that pushed me to go to that event. And I didn't really know anyone. I knew Jonathan and Brad from the Choose Five podcast. I knew a couple of other names there, but you know, I, I was like, quote unquote, nobody. Nobody knew who I was. I didn't really know anybody else. But that weekend just absolutely transformed my life because like I was reading all these blogs, listening to all these podcasts, watching YouTube videos. But until going at, going back again to the real person thing. Until I shook hands with someone who's like, yeah, I retired at 30, it feels so much more real and attainable than just reading it on a computer screen where you can't see the person. Like it, you just – you don't get that warmth of connection. And so that that first event, there was probably like 65 people. And after that, like I probably keep in contact with 20 or 30 of those people from that first event. Wow. Like on not, not on a weekly basis or anything, but I'm checking in every couple of – every like six months to a year or seeing them at other events and – that event was absolutely transformative for my whole career. Interesting. And so you're in Massachusetts, like your your network there, your your friends and and some of the folks that you hang out there, are they into this stuff? Like it, I, I find it so important to have like like minded folks to pull you in a certain direction. And if you're not careful, they can pull you in the wrong direction. So I know just moving to Longmont and being able to hang out in person and go hiking on a random Thursday or something like that has been really cool. So what's it like in your, your home that you're at right now? Yeah. So I definitely have like different segments of friends and they're all interested in different stuff. Like I have people who I'm friends with just from this community, like from having the podcast, from networking at FinCon, from people hearing me on other podcasts, like there's Boston meetup groups, all that stuff. And all those people, they're all like-minded. Like they're all about this, this stuff. I'd say bits and pieces of Phi, which is just like a huge all-encompassing umbrella, like side hustle, real estate. Like I have friends who are interested in side hustling. I have friends who are like really interested in frugality. I have friends who are interested in travel rewards. I wouldn't say all of them are like fully embodying every single tenant of Phi, but definitely some of them have commonalities with me that I can talk to them about. And it's a lot of fun. Like you said, talk and shop with people who kind of get it. Very good. And let's can we talk a little bit more about mindset and was there any like big shift for you was there any like specific moment i guess maybe when you were in high late high school or like early college was there anything where everything changed for you yeah well the first one is definitely the four hour work week one that was when i realized that like time and money don't have to be linear linearly connected then i'm trying to think I really had a good mindset shift after the book tour. Like when you take that many months off from the stuff you're doing, like I basically put a pause on the blog, the podcast, we had pre-recorded a bunch of episodes. So that was still going, but like I really got to take a step outside of my businesses 
and then refocus on the highest ROI things. So I was doing so many things. Like I'd spend three hours doing something that literally had to no positive impact on my business just because I either like thought it looked good or I thought it would have some kind of impact. But I feel like a lot of people do do that too. Like you get so trapped in the day-to-day of your business that you never take that step back and realize like, am I heading in the right direction? Like if you, if you, for example, were just to make a bunch, like you spend so much time on a YouTube video, you spent like 20 hours creating this five minute video and then you have like a thousand people watch it. Like the ROI is probably not there for you, but if you can identify those things that obviously everyone listening and watching, it might be different for you. But if you can identify like those three or five big things that are going to move your business forward, that's when you can really start to get ahead. So I had a huge shift in mindset and priorities after that book tour when I kind of recalibrated myself. So what did you do after that? How did you implement? Started building systems and hiring VAs for stuff that wasn't worth my time or that I could have a much higher ROI doing something else. So for example, like I'm super frugal and so I'd hate spending money on even like software, a $10 a month software that would make my life so much easier. I would find the workaround that would take me, you know, even if it was like 10 more minutes every time I did that task, just because I didn't want to pay that $10 per month thing. And now I've gotten over that and it has just made my businesses one grow and two just made my life so much easier. And I do not have to work as hard and as long on certain things. Cody. Yeah. Me me too, (laughs) man. Cause it's like, Oh, I could figure out a free way to do this. And why don't I just spend 20 hours trying to figure out how to like code this weird thing that's not (laughs) supposed to integrate. So did you use like Zapier or something like that? Or what are some specific tools that you're paying for now? Oh yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I love Zapier. I do have the paid version of Zapier and that just like, that makes my life so much easier. I can have forms that automatically put people with certain tags in my email list. I can have people get sent an email once they opt into something like I love Zapier. Uh, ConvertKit is another one that's absolutely huge. I was trying to do everything for free on MailerLite and it's just not quite as functional as ConvertKit. ConvertKit has just so much more optionality and the tagging is superb and you can like put people through year long funnels if you want to. So ConvertKit's another big one. Canva Pro, I do a lot of like graphic design type stuff, especially with now that I have the Etsy shop going. So that was a, another one that I didn't want to really invest in, but I'm like, you know what? It's so much better than just the free version of Canva. What else do I use? QuickBooks, that's another one that I was just like, I'd only use an Excel sheet to do all my accounting. And QuickBooks has made that process so much better. And like I used to spend so many hours going through and trying to figure out my taxes. And now it's just like basically the export button. <laughs> wow. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And and once you start, you know, getting money in, it, obviously it feels a little more comfortable. So you're not going in the hole or anything yeah. like that, which as a frugal dude, you probably wouldn't be doing that anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. And I know you're big time into to health and, and fitness and stuff like that. And you, you fed me something you sort of wanted me to ask you about, which I think it's great because I'm, I'm sort of, I try to be healthy, but I, I actually drink a lot of beer. I'm a home brewer. So I drink a lot of beer, like my alcohol, but how, how does health and personal finance like fit together for you personally? Yeah. Well, first of all, Doug, you look like a fit guy. So I don't know if you're, you shouldn't be bashing yourself, but <laughs> I, I think there's so many similarities or parallels you can draw between personal finance and health and health and wellness. And like for five, for example, like a lot of people don't want to go through the, it's, it is hard work at first to kind of rewire like your spending. Cause if you're, you know, the big thing about five is just like spend less than what you make and invest the rest. That's like, that's, if you had to boil it down to one sentence, that's pretty much what financial independence is all about. And it's kind of the same thing with like eating and dieting. Like it might suck for the first week if you're, if you, all you do is eat junk food and you don't monitor the things you're eating, you're eating a ton of simple carbs and processed foods and sugar and stuff. Yeah. That first week's going to suck. Maybe even the first two weeks will suck. But once you kind of rewire the way your brain thinks and you're like, okay, this healthy food's actually pretty good. It, it just takes that one little shift and then the rest of your life will be so much better. It's the same thing with money. Like you could be spent living paycheck to paycheck. And if you do have the margin, if the, if the reason why you're living paycheck to paycheck is because you're spending on frivolous things and then you cut those things out and realize like, Hey, my time is a lot more important than my money. It just takes that little mindset shift that may, might take a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. And then your whole life is absolutely transformed after that. So when people ask me like about financial independence, I always try to draw that parallel between like health and wealth. I think it's a, it's a really good one to draw. Interesting. And have you read the book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg? I have. 
So early in the book, and I, I haven't read it in probably 18 months or something, I need to reread it again, but there is the concept of the keystone habit. And I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but if people go to the gym and work out, even if it's a terrible workout and they just walk in the door, put their their bag in the locker and then walk around and then go home after that, <laughs> it's it's better and they end up being more disciplined and they spend better, their personal finance improves and just everything like gets better if they can like basically delay gratification. Like the whole thing is de delayed gratification. So I, I, I definitely think it, it goes hand in hand and it's hard. It, it sucks when you're, you know, thinking about food. I, I intermittent fast pretty often, which Me I too. think that, that helps <laughs> a lot. Do, do you find like mental benefits as well? Uh, a little bit. I definitely have more clarity. I think when I don't know, it it definitely helps just like fine tune my my body and mind. As corny as that might sound. <laughs> yeah, like um, how often do you do it? Like, what's your protocol? There's a lot of different approaches. Yeah, I do it every day, so I don't start eating till noon every single day. And I usually try to cut off at six. I try to keep, do a six hour eating window. I cheat on the weekends absolutely because I drink pretty much every Friday and Saturday, and then drinking leads to eating not so good food. So those are my cheat days, but. Okay. On the good days, on normal days of the week, I'm typically eating in a six hour window and eating a really clean diet. Okay. And do you have any like any social issues like you want to hang out with some other friends and go to trivia on say a Wednesday night? Is it kind of weird where you're like, you know what, I'm stopping eating, I'm not drinking anything and you're just like drinking water or are you able to like tailor it pretty well to exactly how you want to, you know, handle your, your social life? Yeah, I'm definitely pretty flexible. I'm definitely like an 80-20 guy. Like I, if it's going to impact my social life, like I like going out and for your example, like I'd like I'd go out and on a Wednesday night and go to trivia at eight o'clock and have a couple beers like that's fine. As long as I'm like good 80 percent of the time, I can screw around the other 20 percent of the time. I'm a big, big believer in that. I really don't think if I were someone and if I were feeling like restricted in any way, shape or form or unhappy, then I wouldn't want to be doing this. But it's fun and I'm feeling good about myself and I'm still enjoying myself when I want to. Awesome. Yeah, I think I end up doing that too. Just, you know, you want to go out and hang out and I like to try new beers and all that stuff. And there's plenty of breweries around here. So, all right, let's dig in a little bit for the Etsy uh, shop that you have. I'm basically completely ignorant on Etsy. Can you describe uh, number one, what it is for the people that have like no clue? And then what do you, what do you sell on your shop? Yeah, so I'll give a shout out to my business partner, Julie, because she turned me on to this. I had no idea. I had like never really been on Etsy. And I know a lot of my guy friends, I know Etsy's it's like 85% women or something like that. I didn't even know you can make money on Etsy. But she showed me that she was making all this money making these bachelorette party printables, like all these games that people would print out and play at their their bachelorette parties. And I was like, wow, people like are paying you money for that. And you just make the design once and then you can kind of collect profits in perpetuity. I was like, all right, that's really cool. And so we teamed up and built three different side hustle courses. The most popular one was this Etsy one. So I hopped on and I started building up my Etsy shop and it was doing pretty good, but it wasn't until the week of Valentine's Day. So I made a bunch of these like Valentine's Day themed printables. Like I made love coupons. I made these like custom Valentine's Day cards. I made like classroom Valentine's, just all this different stuff. Because one of the big things on Etsy is like if you can keep up with seasonal trends, it will really reward your wallet. So this week, that week, I was skiing in Lake Tahoe, literally had my phone just in my pocket. We were in the lodge for lunch. And by noon, I had made $138 from my printables, literally while I was skiing on the mountain. And I was like, this is super cool. I'm onto something here. And yeah, man, it, it's been really fun ever since. And Etsy is always changing. It's like a fun game. It's kind of like with blogging, like you're always looking at your analytics, trying to figure out which tags work and how you can, you know, get a leg up on the competition. But it, it's been a good ride so far. Awesome. And I take, so you were basically unskilled and you were, you worked through the course material. So you have like a pretty fresh and real case study on like selling stuff on Etsy. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, I had some background and minimal background in graphic design by no means am I a professional graphic designer, but I mean, I can make something that looks halfway decent. So yeah, no professional skills here. And Julie put together a bunch of awesome videos. And then I came in and added some videos later after I'd 
absorbed the course content and started to do my own stuff with my Etsy shop. And yeah, pretty much a living, breathing case study. <laughs> Super cool. And you're using Canva Pro to create the designs or whatever? I have several different ones. I do like Canva Pro, but a lot of my ones are editable and you cannot do that with Canva Pro. So I'll like... I'll build like the background of it in Canva Pro, say for like an invitation. And then I have this software called Cordial where someone can go in and they can type like, you know, Doug's party, RSV at, you put in your phone number because it wouldn't make sense to just have like a, a blanket invitation without the right uh, information. Yeah. Gotcha. And it sounds like a pretty passive thing. Like once you have it set up, uh, aside from like having to come up with like St. Patrick's Day is coming up soon. So you would have to sort of like match those holidays or have some sort of evergreen concept. Like, you know, Ju you mentioned Julie has like a bridal shower. So those are always going on, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, what you're talking about is like, it's pretty passive once you once you make the designs. Like I could probably not touch my shop for a year like I could just stop right now and I'd probably make like maybe 1500 or $2,000. Okay. Which isn't like groundbreaking amount of money, but it's super cool and it's zero maintenance. Yeah. And um, is there any like customer service that you have to deal with or it's like all print on demand kind of stuff or? It's pretty much all print on demand. I have gotten a few questions. Like I think I've only gotten four questions ever, which is awesome. It's pretty self-explanatory. I try to be very clear in the description. Like this is a digital item. Nothing will be shipped. Like this is how you edit. And then there's like a little demo they can use on that cordial website I was talking about. So yeah, it's, it's pretty hands off, man. Like it's, it kind of runs itself after you make the designs. Pretty cool. And wh where do you see it sort of shifting? You mentioned it's like always kind of changing. There's a lot of analytics. And I know once people have data in their hands, they can start making like smarter decisions. So what do you see it say in the next six or eight months? And I, I know you were just working through the case study. So you may, you're not like on the cutting edge of like what's going on, but fair, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I've definitely been learning a ton too. And especially that we have all these people in the course, like I'm there, like I have to do research. And if I don't know the answer to a question that they ask in our Facebook group, like I have to go research it and then it forces me to learn more. So I've become pretty much pr pretty close to in what I call expert in the past, how many months now, eight months or nine months since we launched the course. But to answer your question directly, they've been changing a lot with like, visibility so they've been changing around like it used to be like etsy promoted listings and now it's etsy ads and they're actually rolling out like this new etsy ads thing where you can like delineate with whether you want to advertise on google or on pinterest and all this cool different stuff and so i think that's going to be the game that julie and i are going to be playing over the next several months is figuring out how to optimize and get the most roi for your ad spend because now they're making it where it's just like check a bunch of these boxes and that's where your ad that's where your etsy product is going to show up whereas before it's just like turn on ads Etsy figures out how to uh, allocate that money. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. With all the search engine type, well, everything's a search engine now, but like Pinterest and then Instagram and, and Facebook in the past and like any way you could pull an audience in, in a free fashion for a little while, eventually they start charging yep. for it and ads like become sort of like the default way. So that's exciting. And I guess once you know the ROI, you should be able to like optimize assuming your designs are good and you're actually, you know, giving the customers what they want. So, yeah. And, and it's always changing too. Like you just said, like if you were on Instagram five years ago, you're going to get a lot of traction from Instagram ads. Now they're super suppressed. Even YouTube now, like the ads are starting, or the, the, the content and the reach is starting to get a little bit more suppressed than it was say five years ago. So you're always kind of trying to find the next thing, the next big thing that will give you a lot of organic reach. And so, yeah, that's, that's what we're working through right now. All right. And, you do have a lot of side hustles. Um, any other favorites that you want to like highlight before we sort of shift into some more financial kind of nerdy stuff? Well, I don't know if you want to call this a side hustle, but so I teamed up actually with Grant, the guy I went on the book tour with, and PT, who is the founder of FinCon, and we're running what's called the Financial Freedom Summit this May. It's a, over a thousand plus person event. We got 55 speakers. And yeah, man, so that's that's another one of my big, I don't know if you want to call it a side hustle. It's, a, it's I mean, it's a legit business and it takes up a lot of time. But that's that's another thing I got on my plate that I've been devoting a lot of time to lately because it's in two months. Wow. Where, where is it at? It's in St. Louis from May 1st to May 3rd. Awesome. Yeah, good time of year to be there when warmed up and springtime and all that. Um, what what are some like specific challenges that you've run into in planning like a big, because it's an inaugural event, right? Yeah, yeah, this is the first year, but it's going to be an inaugural event. Just a, like there's so many things behind the scenes that you'd never think about that you just take for granted if you've been to a conference. 
And as a conference, be, being the conference planner, all of a sudden, like these things are like, oh God, like I actually have to go do that thing. I have to figure out how to build the app for the for the scheduling. I have to figure out how to organize the meals and like how many people are going to be there and pay these licensing fees and like all this different random stuff that I never ever would have thought of. But it's been an awesome ride and hats off to PT and his FinCon team because they have been instrumental in streamlining this process because they've been doing their conference for 10 years. So that is very, very helpful for us. Wow. That's amazing. How, how many attendees did you say? Like over a thousand are going to be there? Yeah, we're still selling tickets, but yeah, it's going to be over a thousand people. We, we, I don't know exactly how many of the max capacity is 1400, but it's going to be somewhere between a thousand and 1400. Very cool. That's exciting. Yeah. I'm so new to the community. I didn't even know what's going on. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be fun, man. If you don't make it this year, I'll see you next year. <laughs> right on. Okay, so shifting into some of the more financial stuff, like I said, compound interest and the rule of 72. Can you break it down for the people that haven't heard uh, the concept and why it's so important? Yes, I love this. And especially for people who are my age, because they're like, why should I start saving now? Like, I'm not going to retire for 40 years. It's like, no, that is the wrong way to think about it. So the rule of 72 basically states that if you divide the number 72 – by the interest rate that you're expecting to get in the market, which let's just use historical returns over the past 100 years, it's about 7%. We'll use that. And that's like adjusted for inflation and stuff. So call it 72 divided by 7%. It's about 10. 10 years is the amount of time it will take for your money to double if you invest. So let's, let's do an example. And this might seem like a crazy far-fetched number, but I like using this one. A 25-year-old, you know, they start working at 22 and they're saving really aggressively. They got a good job. They're making like 60 grand out of college, whatever. They save up $100,000 by 25. With the rule of 72, it's going to double every 10 years. By 35, they have $200,000. By 45, they have $400,000. By 55, they have $800,000. And by 65, that ripe old retirement age, they have $1.6 million. And that's without adding any contributions to that original 100K. So I love giving people that picture. Like if obviously that's a very big number and most 25 year olds don't have 100K, but like if you're someone in this community and you find out when you're 16 or 17 and that's what you want to strive for, you can honestly probably put your stuff on cruise control after you save that. And if you're if that's enough to cover your annual expenses using that 4% rule, it's just like a revolutionary kind of idea for people to even wrap their heads around. And a lot of people, unfortunately, we don't get taught this in schools. You don't get taught this in anything. Like you know, like a lot of parents and a lot of uh, teachers don't know this stuff. So like who who's going to tell you if not someone from one of us or someone from the FI community? And yeah, man, I, I love using that rule of 72 example like that. It's, it's so amazing. And I think like I had heard of it when I was roughly your age. I'm 40 now. So 24 seems like so long ago <laughs> to me, man. But uh, basically, I wish I would have known like how powerful it was. I, I was a you know good saver compared to some of my friends. I can't remember. I was saving like you know 15 or 20 percent, which is pretty good compared to my friends who were had had like debt and they had debt out of school and all that stuff. But if I just would have buckled down it's like if you add more money to it, um, when you run the numbers, like you kind of have to try not to be a millionaire by the time you're, you know. It's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, like the math works really well. And I mean, one of the key components, of course, is your expenses. Like, do you share your actual like personal expenses right now as a single single dude? What, what are yeah. they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so last year is definitely more than typical, but I spent a lot on my businesses. With business expenses, it was about twenty-eight grand. Without business expenses, it was nineteen grand. And so, like, that is super frugal for most people. For someone who's living in the Boston area, yeah, and, and that includes your business expenses. <laughs> twenty-eight thousand includes business expenses. That's so crazy. Yeah, I spend <laughs> I spend way more on software and other stuff apparently. So yeah, mine's way more than that. That's cool. Okay, and, and the thing is, like, a lot of people, and you you know this, Cody, but like. A lot of people just have no clue what they are spending and they may think oh, 19,000, that's nothing. Or they may think 19,000, that's a huge amount. Like people just have no idea like where it's going. Were you always someone who knew their expenses, like say right out of college or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, since I got introduced to the community when I was like 19, I was all about that expense tracking. And like, I always had like Excel models showing like my savings rate and how early I could retire and hit like a the million dollar mark and stuff like that. So I've always been like, if I can maximize my savings rate, and that's another thing, 
the reason why I do this isn't because I like want to be deprived and I'm not deprived at all. I have a good time. But like once you understand, like I was just saying, the power of that savings rate, it's so crazy, man. And I know you're friends with Pete and he has that very famous post called the shockingly simple math behind early retirement. And like when you look at those savings rate numbers and like if you can achieve, say, a 50 percent savings rate, like you're looking at a 10 to 11 year career. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very amazing. And people don't realize it until you look at the numbers because it, it all just sounds like we're crazy, basically. It does. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people tell me I'm crazy, but I'm like, you know what? The numbers work out and people are doing this. Yeah. And um, w well, one thing is it, I, I don't really pay attention to the markets. I'm a big index fund person. And, and then I have like my side hustles and, and I'm generating income and all that stuff. So I don't really pay attention to the markets. I think they're down, right? Like the right now <laughs> yeah. when we're recording this, it's like dramatically down, right? Yes. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot on, I don't really follow too much, but all the people on social media are freaking out. <laughs> and I know there's not, I don't know if I want to call it backlash, but a lot of folks are like, when there's a recession, when the market corrects, a lot of these fire people are going to have a rude awakening, blah, blah, blah. What are your thoughts on that? Because we've been on a market that has been ridiculous. I've, I uh, actually went through a for foreclosure. I've been through a couple down markets, and you know, I went through the dot com bubble, and then, you know, the big recession or whatever they call it. And I'm like, oh, you know what? This is great, but I know that something's coming. So, what do you think about all this stuff? This bull market. Yeah. Well, when you look at the trends just over like a certain period of time, and I'll do an animation with my finger, like. If you're looking at a month of the stock market, it looks like this. And for people who are listening to the podcast, I'm just throwing my hand up and down a crazy squiggly line. But if you look at the market over a 10-year span, it's just like a pretty you know, smooth, gradual groove up. And that's what the market's done for the past 100 years. And so, yeah, of course, like if you are going to buy a house next year, you don't want to – and like you need all that money to buy the house that you're going to buy – you don't want to put it into the market and then pray that it doesn't go down because it might go down and it might be down for the next three years. But you're not you don't you're not looking at that money to you're not looking to spend that money in the next three years. You're looking for that money to finance your retirement or like 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. So that's how I like to think of it. Like if you need to touch that money, then maybe you shouldn't put it into these retirement accounts. Like if you really need it for the best example I have is a home purchase. But most of the time, like this is money you don't want to touch for a really long time. And that's that's the money I'm putting away. Like I'm not planning on touching this money for decades to come. So that, that's what I say to those naysayers who are like, yeah, the next market crash is going to wipe everybody out. Like, no, the financial independence community knows that the market does this because a lot of them are listening to these podcasts and reading these books and all that stuff. They understand how the market works. So they're some of the best positioned people to weather a storm like this, whereas the average investor might sell in a panic, sell at a huge loss, and then be scared to invest for the next five years as the market's rising, finally get back in, and then kick themselves for not getting in earlier. Well said. I think there's a lot of nuance that you know big press and media can't really get into, but I just bought a bunch of stuff. So I know the market could go down a little bit more, but I had some money and I was waiting for a little uh, discount sale. So I bought a few things in the last couple of days here. So Love it, man. Me too. I just maxed out my Roth for the year. <laughs> and it's only March. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. I know a lot of people are thinking, you know, those expenses are super low. You must be depriving yourself and that sort of thing. So what areas do you treat with like less priority? For example, I have uh, an old shitty 2005 F-150 that, um, you know, it's fine, but people probably don't really appreciate it too much. And then there's some areas where I splurge. So where do you cut back? Cause you don't care about it. And what are some things that are really important to you and you're going to spend some money on? So I basically don't give a shit about housing or transportation whatsoever. Like I will literally live on a mattress on the floor in someone's basement if I have to, if that will save me the most amount of money. Like I don't right now, I'm in my apartment in Boston right now, but like I'm only paying $645 a month because I have some roommates with me and we got an awesome deal. So like that's saving on housing. Transportation, I actually, I didn't buy the car I have now, but I inherited it because yeah, long story. I inherited this car. I didn't pay for it. Food is one I definitely save a lot on. I try to minimize my grocery bill as much as possible. And then I guess for splurging, I definitely go out like for entertainment type stuff. Like I'm, I go to the bars with my friends. I'm 24 years old. Like a lot of them are still going out to the bars, you know, two or 
sometimes three nights a week <laughs> and sometimes I go out to restaurants and it's just fun. That, that's probably where I splurge and splurge and especially on experiences too. Although I am a huge fan of travel rewards. So I lo- oftentimes get flights and accommodation and stuff for free. But yeah, the, I think those big three, it's like, I think housing, transportation and food makes up like 70% of the average Americans monthly expenditures. And like, so if you can minimize those big three, like you have a lot more leeway to spend in those ones that might be fun. And actually, I have to give a shout out to my co-host, Justin, on the podcast. Something he says, and it's like a, a phrase that I've loved and come to adopt, is he'll ask someone who's asking about this whole Fi thing, like, all right, hey, what did you eat last Tuesday for lunch? And they'll be like, I don't know. Like, I have no idea. And he's like, okay. He's like, what's the last like fun concert or experience or event or something you went to? And their eyes light up. They're super pumped. They're telling you all about it. And he goes, that. He goes, that's what you should be spending money on. Why should you spend a ton of money on the things that you're going to forget a week later? So I'm not one to you know go out and spend $100 on a dinner because I literally might forget that dinner a week later. And it's so easy to rack up those really expensive you know nights of going out. So I try to really spend on the things that I will remember, the things that will influence my life, like travel and meeting people and going out and networking and stuff like that. Awesome. And you mentioned travel rewards. Any quick tips for you know people that haven't been taking advantage of that? Yes. Okay. So a lot of people, it's like such a scary thing and people are like, this has to be a scam, right? myself included before I kind of got into this whole movement I was like there's no way you can just like hit a minimum spend on a credit card and then you got all these points and you can just like go to Europe for free place basically but it works so for people who are who've never kind of gotten in the space before do a little bit of research but there's just some like boilerplate easy cards to start with like a lot of people I tell them Capital One Venture or like the Chase Sapphire Preferred like those are super easy cards to get and then fig- not get you have to have a decent credit score mm-hmm. but to figure out how to use like Basically, the gist of travel rewards is you're trying to hit all these different sign-up bonuses. So, like, I have actually my one of my Chase cards right here. And so I got the Chase card. You have a three-month window to spend $4,000. And then if you hit the, the minimum spend within that window, you get this big sign-up bonus. It was, like, 60,000 points. 60,000 points, like, through the Chase portal, for example, with this specific card – that's a round trip to Europe. Like, That's a round trip to Europe on United or British or like a lot of these partner airways that you can cash in your points. And that stuff, it's just like easy. Like I'm not changing my spending. I'm not spending extra money on stuff I wouldn't typically purchase. I'm just getting the card, paying it off every month. That's a big thing. Do not carry a balance on these credit cards. I've heard of people who are like, yeah, I love travel awards, like, but I have a $3,000 credit card balance. I'm like, that's not, <laughs> that's not how to do it. But yeah, man, like it's it just get started and you don't have to get, get crazy with it. Like I've had like 25 cards at this point because I'm like really into this stuff, but just get one. And once you kind of once you get the feeling of it and it's fine if you don't get another card for another year down the road. But if, if you can get one cool free vacation or flight out of it, that is totally worth it in my book. Oh, yeah. And I another vote for Chase. I think I have a Chase Inc., which is the business version. And I yeah. going back to the expenses, my business spends a decent amount of money. So I, I think I got 80,000 points for spending say $5,000 in eight months or sorry, yep. in six months or something like that. So yeah, you can accumulate points. And then if you get a business card, you know that you're like, you're always accumulating points and I, I don't look too often, but yeah, I, I have a ton of points. So you could just switch around. Like you said, you don't have to go crazy, but you can't take advantage if you're already spending the money anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely don't change spending, but actually I'm curious, have you cashed in on any cool vacations or anything? Not, not recently, but, um, a couple years ago we did, I think we, we got like, it was a cross country trip. I used to live in Atlanta. So we, we flew to SF and got like first class tickets and did like a, a coastal road trip up to like Portland and Seattle. So that, that was awesome. And we took advantage of, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the points that we had accumulated, as well as the the first class seats. My wife doesn't love to fly. Oh, sweet. So <laughs> having awesome. the extra room and endless drinks always helps. <laughs> it does help. Yeah. So a couple other uh, questions as we're finishing up here. Any like go-to books that were really influential for you? I know I'm, I've said the four-hour work week a hundred times, but I'll say it again. I love the okay. four-hour work week. Outside of personal finance, some books that have really shaped like the mindset and way I think about stuff. I don't know if you've ever read anything by Yuval Harari. He's the author of Sapiens and Homo Deus and 21 Lessons. I really loved those books. Like when I first dived in to um, 
the first one, I'm like a uh, Sapiens. The Sapiens is the first one. It like completely transformed kind of the way I thought about life. And I know this is completely outside the realm of what we've been talking about, personal finance, but I always tell people like that's an, such an awesome read. Cool. I recently, it's a long one. It's a pretty long one. I don't it's know. It's pretty how, long. Yeah. I, I listened to the audio book on like a long road trip and it was, it was great. Like I just kept, I kept one like wanting to drive longer so I could keep listening to it. <laughs> so cool. And then any big mistakes, you've started a few companies, you're working on a lot of exciting new things, uh, trying new stuff, any highlights of your mistakes? So I'd say most of the mistakes have been in that disc golf company and just physical products in and of themselves are much more difficult than digital products because it's like a physical thing and it has to be perfect. But I'll say like the mistakes that we've made in that business have definitely shaped the successes that I've had in my other businesses. Like I had no idea what I was doing reaching out like in terms of networking with pro shops, which is basically the retail stores. I didn't know what I was doing with Facebook ads or Google ads. No clue whatsoever. We wasted a bunch of money. We used to click like boost posts and stuff, which for people who actually run ads, that's like the worst thing you can do. <laughs> but yeah, man, I, I think I, I hate like pointing at mistakes and saying like that. I wish that didn't happen because – Honestly, I wouldn't be where I am today if that stuff didn't happen. So, yeah, just some some logistical nightmares. Like I remember when we got our first discs out, we actually we raised ten thousand dollars via Kickstarter, and so we had a deadline to deliver. It was like October twenty seventeen or sixteen. I'm not. I'm getting the years mixed up. But like we had a really hard deadline, so we're pushing our manufacturer, pushing, 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 and they gave us all these discs. Like it was like two thousand something discs, and fifty percent of them were absolute shit we had literally had to throw them away because they were such bad production quality and like obviously that's a huge mistake and a huge lesson learned like don't wait to the last minute don't trust someone else to do your quality control but we learned lessons in business and relationships and networking and all that good stuff <laughs> yeah and i think you know most most people luckily that i'm interviewing on the show they have that outlook too it's like i needed to learn that lesson firsthand to really see what it's like and go through the the pain and the you know lessons learned afterwards so Absolutely. excellent um and, and last question here any cool purchases uh just recently um either for business or personal or just something you're like hey this, i'm really glad i got this thing so i know we were talking a little bit before we we hit record here about youtube i've been starting to kind of dip my foot into the youtube world a little bit and so i just bought like all these youtube stuff like i bought this this nice lav mic that i can attach to my phone and stuff for selfie videos and whatnot i bought this nice ring light and these uh i don't even know what you call them like the the they look, they kind of look like this shape uh -huh. <laughs> for people in the podcast. It's like yeah. the lamps, the lamps basically. Oh, oh yeah. Just a lighting kit or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Like a lighting kit. So I, I'm, I'm excited. I got all this new stuff. I recorded a video yesterday and it came out really awesome, like way better than all the other ones I've been doing. So that's, that's kind of what, I, that's kind of what I'm excited about right now. And that's just what's coming to mind because it's the most recent purchase I had. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's super fun. I, I love all the gadgets and gear I have way more camera stuff and tripods than I actually need, but I'm like, Oh, maybe this small one is really the tripod that I need. So what, what are you going to cover on your uh, YouTube channel? So mostly the stuff that we're going to do is for the Etsy shop of the Etsy course that we have myself and Julie, because there is a huge market. There's a lot of people looking for Etsy tips on YouTube. And so we're hoping that we can capture at least a little, a little bit of that and drive them to get some of our resources and ultimately purchase the course if they're interested. Very cool. Well, we'll definitely link up to that. And Cody, where do you want people to find you? You got a, a few places out there in the world. Yeah. So, I mean, people are obviously listening to podcasts, so definitely go check out my podcast, The Fi Show. That's the Financial Independence Show. And then if you're on YouTube, we're starting up the YouTube channel. Give me some feedback. Let me know how I can get better like Doug. And uh, <laughs> it, that's that's Gold City Ventures. So that's the name of the Side Hustle Courses, and that's where the YouTube videos will be living. All right. Very good. We'll link up to all that stuff to make sure it's really easy for uh, people to get into. And yeah, once you get rolling a little bit more on YouTube. would love to have you back on just to hear about like the behind the scenes, what you've learned, um, things you're shifting. Cause I, I love to geek out on all that stuff. And it's really fun because you get so much data from YouTube. It's, it's almost scary. <laughs> so, <laughs> so much data. Well, thanks a lot, Cody. Really appreciate you being on the show today. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. This was a blast.
Thanks again to Cody Berman. Be sure to check out the podcast. It's a pretty awesome one. It's one that I've added to my rotation and I've subscribed to it. He also is gonna be putting a little more time in YouTube. So we'll put a link up there. You can see what he's been up to. And the conference, if you're able to check it out or if you if you happen to be like in the St. Louis area and it's pretty easy for you to get over there, check out the Financial Freedom Conference. Again, there's gonna be a lot of uh, you know cool people there as far as speakers and then you're gonna be around like a thousand other like-minded folks. So I highly encourage you to check it out. And again, thanks Cody, really appreciate the time today. We'll catch you on the next episode.